Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you tuning. Thank you for tuning in to Envoy Global's uh, LinkedIn Live first LinkedIn Live session of 2024. Uh, today's topic: final reminders of four H1B cap season. Um, I am uh, delighted to welcome Ann Walsh and Scott Idehart uh, today to, uh, to today's uh, live streaming session. Anne and Scott are both with Corporate Immigration Partners. Um, and Anne, I'll turn it over to you first just to provide our audience with a brief overview of your career and the kind of uh, the work that you do with CIP. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Eric. Hi, everyone. Uh, as Eric said, I'm Anne. I've been with Corporate Immigration Partners for um, 12 plus years. Uh, my practice is, gosh, at this point, probably about 98% employment-based, uh, but I'm familiar with the uh, family-based side, so can do that kind of work too. Um, I've worked with all sorts of companies um, throughout my career, um, software, cloud, manufacturing, all the way to, um, I've done cases for extreme pogo stick jumpers. So really um, wide uh, range of expertise. Um, love what I do, think it's really important. And um, regarding personal life, I live in Milwaukee, have three kiddos and one uh, 70 pound, uh, pound dog who might appear, we'll see. Um, and uh, so really happy to be here. Thank you so much, Ann. Uh, yeah, I, I moved to the basement because I wasn't sure if my dogs were, were going to make an appearance. And, and with two of them, you never know. Uh, but thank you so much. Um, and a quick shout out, Ann, uh, to you for um, your podcast episode that we did about a month ago. It's live on our YouTube page uh, for everyone tuning in right now. I highly recommend checking that out, uh, where Ann also dives further into some elements of the H1B and talks a little bit more um, about that type of content. Uh, Scott, um, thank you so much for hopping on uh, this morning. Uh, before we went live, we we're you know just just chatting. Uh, you were based in the West Coast, but you are now firmly a Midwest transplant. Is that correct? That is correct, and I'm I'm braving the winters out here, uh, which is going <laughs> it's going okay so far. But you're right; I was in the Bay Area for you know basically my entire life. Practiced there for about eight years before moving out here. And I've been with corporate immigration partners for about a year and a half. And um, like Anne, my, my practice is focused on employment-based immigration, but have some mixed experience with some more uh, family-based immigration and, and um, some pro bono work as well. So I'm excited to, to be here and chatting with you. It's a, an exciting time of the year. Sure is. It sure is. Uh, and I think with that, that's a perfect segue to hop into uh, today's topic of conversation, which is the H-1B electronic registration and H-1B cap season overall, uh, which uh, starts very, very soon. Uh, I know today is February 29th, so we are in a leap year. Uh, but Scott, uh, first question for you is when is H-1B electronic registration opening up? So the formal electronic registration process opens next Wednesday on the 6th, uh, but we've been you know, preparing the past months for this, uh, this registration to open. So a lot of work has gone into it already. Mm -hmm. And what, what has that preparation looked like uh, leading up to, to March 6th? So it's been working with our clients, our immigration contacts at our clients to identify the employees that they want to sponsor in the H-1B cap. A lot of documentation and information gathering. We want to make sure that we have all the appropriate documents so we can confirm how we're going to be registering their employees in the, the registration process. Um, and just a lot of coordination to make sure that we have all the, the names necessary. We want to make sure that no one is left behind. Yeah, for sure. How important is transparent communications um, throughout this entire uh, H-1B process? Yeah, it's, it's hugely important, not only for us to be in close communication with our HR contacts, our immigration contacts, but also to be very close in closely in touch with the employees. You know, this is their chance to, to obtain an H-1B visa. And, you know, it, it's a lottery where, where nothing is guaranteed. So we want to make sure that we're putting together, you know, the strongest case for them, that we have all their documentation that we know if they're qualified for the master's cap, for example. Um, so we wanna make sure that 
know, we're gathering the documentation, following up if we don't have something, and then just making sure that we're working closely with our HR contacts because this registration process does require us to coordinate uh, through the USCIS system uh, to mm -hmm. file those registrations. Definitely. So, Scott, in the in the, in the realm of you know providing some some uh, you know reminders ahead of March sixth, uh, I'm just going to kind of go over some high level uh, questions regarding H one B electronic registration, kind of what the atten our attendees need to know. Uh, so, first things first, and we'll expand upon this later because I know there's a there's a separate section. But um, how much does H one B electronic registration cost uh, for this year? For this year, it's ten dollars. Which, which doesn't seem like much. <laughs> and that's, you know, $10 per, per registration. Exactly. Yeah. It's yeah. per registration per individual. So, um, you know, anyone who's having a registration filed in their behalf, $10 uh, specific to them. Gotcha. And how long is uh, the registration period open this year? It'll last through the 22nd of March. So we'll have a couple of weeks to get everyone registered and one question that we always get is, is there any advantage to getting registered on the first day? And the answer is no. Uh, we mm -hmm. want to make sure that we're being careful with the registration, that we're putting in the information correctly. So as long as we get it in before March 22nd, that's the important thing. Gotcha. So uh, what you're saying in, in, in our podcast episode, uh, and we were chatting about it, but in the old days when filing the full petition, uh, the goal was you always wanted that full petition submitted April 1. So what you're saying is you're, we don't have to do everything on March 6th. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It gives us a little bit more flexibility. We're not uh, crunched to do everything in one day, uh, which is nice. Yeah. Yeah. It used definitely. to be that FedEx UPS trucks would like cause traffic jams delivering to the USCIS service centers because they had so many paper H1B cap petitions to deliver for the lottery. So thankfully that at least is removed from this process now. Yes. Although we don't get the, and we, we don't, we're not able to see the pictures that, that uh, you would take of the stack of petitions. Right. I know. Swimming <laughs> in the petitions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so Scott, yeah, you mentioned, so oh, uh, March 6th closes uh, March 22nd. What happens after March 22nd? Or, I mean, I guess what happens after March 22nd, but then also what, uh, for those listening in, like kind of what are your high level uh, guidance, tips, et cetera, for what to be doing during the registration period as well? Sure. So during this registration process, assuming USCIS receives enough registrations to meet the quota, which is 85,000, um, I think we're very much guaranteed to meet that. Um, the process will go to a lottery, and that's essentially what the H-1B cap is. It's a lottery, which USCIS will run after all the registrations are in, and they'll first run uh, the master's cap lottery. They'll select 20,000 to meet the initial master's cap quota, and then they'll put everyone into the, the regular cap, the 65,000 remaining. Um, and once those are identified, um, I, typically by the end of the month, we can expect that USCIS will run the lottery by the end of March, and then we'll have a 90 day period in which to file full petitions for those individuals. And how, how are beneficiaries as well as their uh, HR teams notified if they're selected or not selected, et cetera? Yeah. So there's an online portal where we'll be notified as, as the legal representative, and then we'll make sure to coordinate with our clients to make sure that they're aware of who was selected. We'll reach out to the the employees as well to make them aware. Um, and then we'll go ahead and, and start the remaining information gathering. If we need any mm -hmm. remaining documents from the employees in order to file the case, um, anything for form preparation, if we need a full job description from the client, we'll go ahead and reach out for that at that point. Got it. Uh, so Scott, um, you know, you mentioned that up and uh, you've been, both you and Ann have been working with clients, you know, to get prepared for the March 6th um, registration. Um, for those who might be listening in, who maybe are feeling like they're behind or maybe they haven't started, what are your words of wisdom and are, do, are they behind in reality? Yeah, in, a, in an ideal world, we want to have all the documentation at this point. We want to know who we're registering so that we can make sure we have all the details necessary so it is a little bit late in the game, but 
certainly if, if you have anyone else that you've identified um, and you want to enter them into the lottery, you know, reach out to your immigration counsel, reach out to us, and we can let you know if it's possible to still register someone. Uh, we do still have some clients who are coming to us with employees that they've, they've identified and we want to do everything that we can to, to get them into the lottery if possible. Uh, but the important thing is the documentation. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to know certain details about the employees. And I, I know that uh, Anne will likely be going into more detail on this, but one important thing this year is definitely to have the passport. That's going to be a key this year. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, and anything else to add on just uh, some of the first uh, first topics regarding uh, this year's H-1B cap uh, before we hop into some of the other uh, content? On the last topic, you know, am I behind? I'd say it's not over till it's over. So as Scott said, the last day to register is March 22nd, 12 Eastern. So if uh, you've still identified an individual who you want to register, raise a hand, get in touch with your immigration service provider. You know, we're all in this uh, to, to help, so uh, speak up. And you know, certainly uh, we work to, to see what we can do to get that person registered. In that well said, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, the next topic of conversation um, it regards uh, strengthening the integrity of the H-1B program. Uh, and this is kind of a follow-up, but we initially talked about this on our podcast episode, after some of the uh, rules had come up, but they weren't finalized yet, or they were just uh, had been finalized early at the time. Um, the first one I want to talk with you about is the final rule that USCIS published that makes some key improvements to the selection process. Uh, specifically, the program change uh, reduces the potential for fraud in the registration system and gives all beneficiaries equal potential for being selected regardless of the number of registrations submitted on their behalf. Now, registrations will be chosen based on the unique beneficiary instead of the registration, which gives all beneficiaries an equal chance of being selected regardless of the number of registrations that employees submit on their behalf. So, Anne, let's break that one down. Um, yeah. First question, what is this rule in a nutshell? Yeah, so... Um... It used to be that USCIS selected based on registration number. So each time a beneficiary was uh, registered, they got a registration number. So the more times you're registered, the more likely to be selected. Um, they've changed that. And as you said, this year's selection will be beneficiary centric. And as Scott said, uh, it's going to be based on passport number. So even if an individual is registered two, three, five, ten, twenty 20 times, they're only going to have the same chance of selection as an individual registered once because their passport number will only go in once. So it is a, um, an important change. Gotcha. How might this rule impact HR teams? Yeah, so... For HRs, I think it's pros and cons. It helps level the playing field um, because regardless of resources that a company may have, you know, the one person that they register has the same chance of uh, another individual registered a number of times. Um, and as I said, it is going to, you know, give a better chance of selection to each individual. We're likely to see the number of registrations come down significantly from last year. In 2023, there were about 750,000 registrations. That was up from maybe about 400,000 the year prior. And that surge was because of the multiple registrations. So because multiple registrations don't make a difference to likelihood of selection. We're expecting to see the number sort of normalized, maybe back to that 400,000, which will improve the chances of each individual being selection, uh, being selected, excuse me. So that's a pro for HR. Um, 
con is that the employers are likely going to be unaware if their employees or their prospective employees are being sponsored by another company. Um, because individuals can be sponsored more than once, can be registered more than once, so long as it's based on a, a bona fide good faith job offer. And employers are not likely to know that. I'm skeptical, skeptical that employees are going to be sharing that information um, with their employers. So it could be that employers, you know, spend time, spend money registering an individual only to find out that they're selected, but proceeding forward with an H-1B from another company. So unfortunately, we could see that this year. Um, so, you know, and this is you know, obviously uh, seems like it's a big change. Um, generally, how might HR teams just best navigate this rule change? You know, I think from the HR perspective, the hope is that, you know, um, and hopefully you heard me in my last uh, point, that it leans more towards the, the pro of the change and that it's going to level the playing field. Um, it's going to hopefully increase the rate of selection. So hopefully most HRs are um, optimistic and, and thankful for this change. You know, that said, um, you know, it, it's, it's worthwhile to have a connection with the employees and prospective employees that you're registering, you know, to have, a, uh, you know, the expectation that, yes, they truly intend to accept this job um, if selected. So certainly if it's a present employee, I think that's um, rather intuitive, but with prospective employees, you know, just remind them that the intention in registering them is if they are selected, that they take the position with your company. Gotcha. And what about from the uh, beneficiary standpoint, uh, what should they know and just kind of understand about this rule change and how it may impact them? Sure. Same for beneficiaries, you know, equalizing the playing field. If you're registered once versus registered many times. And on the other side of the coin regarding, you know, the good faith bona fide job offer, um, individuals need to ensure that every company that's registering them, that they have a good faith bona fide intent to work for that company. Because last year when USCIS announced that there were 750,000 and the surge was on account of multiple registrations, they were displeased, uh, uh, to say the least. So um, you do not want to be in a situation where USCIS feels like you're gaming the system through registrations, because they clearly do not want to see that happen again. I think it says a lot uh, to, your, to your last point that this rule change came out one year after the, you know, the 700,000 plus, uh, registrations and, you know, just the, the quickness that the rules introduced and finalized, uh, and any other clarifications or changes from this, uh, cap registration final rule, uh, to share. The benefit beneficiary centric, uh, selection is the big one. They also are allowing for a start date after October 1st, if that makes sense for the petition. You know, there are plenty of individuals who have OPT or STEM OPT that can uh, carry their work authorization for some time. So starting this year, we can put a start date after October 1st. And um, additionally, uh, USCIS didn't go uh, without the opportunity to uh, codify that they're going to have the ability to deny or revoke an H-1B based on a registration that they believe was false or invalid, uh, based on a false attestation, likely related to that bona fide job offer, good faith intention. Um, so they don't uh, miss the opportunity to get that in writing. All right. Thank you so much. 
I'm going to take a quick pause here uh, for anyone who is listening in. Uh, if you do have any questions for Scott or Anne, uh, please go ahead and type them into the LinkedIn live chat and we'll uh, take a look at them and do our best to address um, any questions. So Scott, moving on to our next big uh, topic and reminder uh, for this H-1B cap season, USCIS has changed some of the, some of the fees. Uh, they issued a final, they also issued a final rule impacting fees. And this is the first time since 2016 that most immigration and naturalization benefit request fees have changed. So I want to break some of these down with you first, uh, starting with the H-1B. Uh, one of my first questions uh, to you when we started was how much does electronic registration cost? And you said $10, but that's for this year. What about for the future? Yeah, the glory days of the $10 registration will be behind us. Uh, the fee is going up to 215 next year, which doesn't sound like a lot in the grand scheme of things. But if you think about it, it's, you know, an over 2000% increase. So significant in that sense. And was this a fee increase kind of being discussed up until behind the scenes? Or is this also kind of a response to what 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 we saw last year with the 700,000 plus um, submitted registrations? Yeah, they've been USCIS has been talking about it for a few years now. But I think you're right that it probably was directly in response to the astronomical level of registrations that have been filed in the past, the $10 threshold was was pretty low, uh, low barrier to entry. So I think that the 215 figure is in, intended to sort of cut down on uh, maybe the frivolous registrations that may have been filed for certain by certain companies. What, what other uh, fee increases uh, did USCIS uh, introduce at the start of this year? So one to start with that's already in effect is a change to the premium processing uh, fee, which previously was 2500 uh, Just a few days ago, actually, on the 26th, that premium processing fee went up to 2805 2805 um, And for everyone out there, premium processing uh, is where you can pay an additional fee uh, to receive a decision quicker than you would under regular processing. Um, and the fee that I mentioned directly relates to most employment-based filings there are, you know, separate fees uh, for other types of filings that may be lower. Uh, can you can you talk about some of those uh, other fees? Sure. So, well, the premium processing fee is one that's already in effect, um, but uh, USCIS also came out with some pretty substantial fee increases for filings across the board, um, and those will go into effect on April first, barring any, uh, you know, legal challenges that that may come. Um, for H-1Bs in particular, uh, the base fee is going up from 460 to 780, so a pretty significant increase, um, and that's just the base fee. Um, USCIS has also um, come out with an additional fee, they're calling it an asylum program fee of 600 for most employers uh, with certain discounts for smaller employers and nonprofits. Um, so those are the big ones for the H-1B uh, filings. But as I said, there, there are a number of fee changes across the board that will impact employment-based immigration. Definitely, yeah. Just to quickly share some additional info, uh, we have a news alert available on our website uh, that maybe if uh, one of my Envoy Global colleagues can link to uh, in this chat uh, to share, uh, that'd be appreciated. I have to give Envoy credit. They've done a great job of keeping track of all these changes. There are so many different uh, fee levels yeah. based on size of employer, based on whether it's a nonprofit. Um, so, it, you know, it, it really does come down to, you know, how big of an employer are you? Do you have over 25 employees? Um, are you a nonprofit? Um, those are things that we have to work closely with our clients on to identify the exact fees. Um, but mm -hmm. To sort of to put things in perspective for a, a large H-1B employer, the overall government filing fees for a new H-1B are going from uh, 2,460 to 3,380. So um, as you can see, it's, it's a pretty significant difference. Mm -hmm, definitely. Are there any exemptions for these fee increases? 
Yeah, so USCIS has taken somewhat of a tiered approach, especially for employment-based immigration. So for employers over uh, with over 25 full-time employees, they're subject to sort of the, the highest level of fees. Uh, for example, the one I mentioned, the $780 fee for an H-1B, that applies to larger employers, whereas um, uh, nonprofits and smaller employers uh, are not seeing that same fee increase. It'll stay at 460. Um, for certain humanitarian file, humanitarian based filings um, for individuals who uh, may not have the financial means to pay the fees for uh, military veterans, there are exemptions for some of the other fee increases that we're seeing. But in in the employment based context, it's very much uh, sort of that tiered approach. Uh, based on the size of the employer and whether uh, they're a nonprofit or not. Um, so Scott, final question for you in this section. Um, you mentioned you, you mentioned that the the fee increases uh, will take will increase April one, but H one B registration closes March twenty second. So th does this mean this year's beneficiaries that are selected will need to pay more when filing their full H one B petition? It does. Yeah. Yeah, em employers who are filing H-1B petitions in this year's H-1B cap, they, they will be subject to these increased fees, again, with the caveat that, uh, you know, we still may see legal challenges, uh, in fact. So uh, there are certain organizations that are you know, planning to challenge these uh, fee increases because they are significant across the board. Um, and so we'll, we'll see. We'll keep a close eye on it. Uh, there, there could be some injunctive relief that would prevent certain fees or all of the fees from going into effect. But barring that, yes, April 1st, those new fees will go into effect, uh, including for H-1B cap filing. And Scott and Anna, uh, what, what's the best resource for uh, viewers to stay, stay on top of these potential legal challenges or just be aware of if anything comes down the line? Yeah, so certainly the Envoy Global blog and the Corporate Immigration Partners website. We publish regularly, I should say constantly, because there's never a dull day in our immigration world, um, for better or worse sometimes. So you can stay tuned to each of those resources and then ensure that your, uh, your attorney or your immigration contact is providing you regular updates that are relevant to your population and opportunities in your business, because it's important that that inf information is being regularly shared in a way that you can easily digest and understand it. That's a critical uh, <laughs> part of our jobs. Yes. Uh, so final big topic before we move on to questions and then uh, wrap things up. And when we recorded our podcast, it was just at the time that USCIS was um, right before they rolled out and we're talking more about the uh, organizational account setup. And I think the day that we were recording, I think like later in that week, there was a, a webinar from USCIS. Uh, so I just wanted to follow up on that topic. And can you talk a little bit more about the new organizational account setup and, you know, the instructions that USCIS has provided? Yeah. So we're still learning. Um, that said this year, uh, the, Reported intention is that um, organizations with multiple divisions that are sponsoring can access through one account. Um, we're still figuring out how that's going to look in practice because there's certain access to the registration portal that we can't get into yet until it officially opens on March 6th. But uh, USCIS, you know, I have been impressed by the information that they've shared and the, the frequency and the content of the, I think they've called them tech talks, that they've uh, hosted on the registration portal. So we're hopeful to get information yet in the coming days to kind of solidify some of our access questions in the uh, accounts. And that said, if we have to figure it out on uh, March 6th, we absolutely will and all others will be in the same boat and as scott said we have till march 22nd to register and there's no benefit uh, of being registered in the first minute 
you know, versus in those final days. Of course, we like to get it done, uh, as do all of our employers. So that will be our goal. But um, with each year, we're kind of working through something new in mm -hmm. electronic registration. I, 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 I sound like a cliche for, for anyone who's been listening. And Anne, I know I mentioned this when, when we last chatted, but uh, it, it is a little bit odd to compliment the government on, on the and, you know, some of the information that they're, that they're providing just, you know, based off historical precedents. Mm -hmm. um, and what are your big recommendations for HR teams, uh, you know, to best prepare for, for this year's H1B registration? Communication with your sponsored population if you need uh information or you know a suggested timeline reach out to your immigration provider that's easy to do uh so communication and empathy you know understand it's a big deal for foreign national employees in the h1b cap so know that some will be absolutely thrilled upon learning of their selection and others will be really, really bummed to say the least. So it's always an interesting time to navigate for HR. That said, you know, let your immigration service provider do as much of that as possible. We know that all our HR contacts and immigration coordinators are incredibly busy. So let us do as much of the communication as possible, as much of the question answering as as possible so that you can be there to be an empathetic uh company support scott anything to add to that yeah you know as ann mentioned there's a lot of anxiety a lot of hopes that go into the h1b cap um and as ann mentioned we want to be in close communication with the employees so identifying backup options if they aren't selected and thinking about um, you know, even potential future lotteries. Um, USCIS in past years has run additional lotteries. So if, if that happens later this summer or, or early in the fall, that could give them a potential, you know, option to file uh, later after this initial selection round. So just keeping that hope and keeping that communication alive so we can identify a route forward if they aren't selected initially. Uh, Scott and Anne, I know we kind of touched on it at the start, but uh, any additional words of wisdom, words of encouragement to any listeners who you know may feel they're they're behind as they're watching or listening today? Yeah, I would say uh, deep breath. You know, um, raise a hand if you know you are an HR coordinator or immigration coordinator, and uh, you've identified an individual. You know, let us know. Uh, we'll see. If if we can do something about it and um, practice patience too with your immigration team. This is our busiest time of the year and we seek to give each and uh, everyone the attention that they need, whether it be H1B cap or otherwise. Um, so practice patience. As Scott said, I think I uh, repeated it too, on March 6th, registration opens. That's not when we're going to see many submissions because that's when we're first getting in. So on March 6th, it's not super helpful to be asking, you know, have I been registered? Have I been registered? Um, that information will, will come to you. Um, so please do practice patience with us. Ask your questions. I don't want to um, dissuade anyone from asking questions. They're important. At the same time, practice patience with us as we work through this busy time of year. Scott, similarly, anything, uh, anything else you would add? No, I, I agree with all of that. It, we know there's a lot of um, nerves, a lot of stress to go around and, um, you know, we're, we're managing it as best we can and we're always uh, here to help. Um, so if there are questions that come up, last second additions to the, the lottery list, let us know and we're happy to work with you. Sounds good. Great. Well, thank you both. Um, those are all the questions that I had uh, for both of you. But uh, so now I'll open the floor, uh, Anne and Scott, if there's anything else uh, top of mind regarding H1B, any other words of wisdom, uh, things like that, um, the floor is yours. Um, Scott, if you want to go first. Sure. Well, I think especially this year, um, it's, it's really important, the communication piece. Um, Anne touched on this with the beneficiary-centric 
selection process. Uh, we want to make sure that you know we have the appropriate documentation. We know that the passport that someone has provided is the one that they're using for all registrations. The last thing that we want to see is someone's uh, registration or petition being thrown out because they used a different passport or uh, travel document for registration with different employers. Um, you know, any any sign of gaming the system is is going to be frowned upon by USCIS and could potentially lead to rejection. So that's that's a big key this year. That's different from in the past. Um, but apart from that, I think it all comes down to the same core principles of communicating with your immigration counsel, communicating with your HR contacts, just making sure that everyone is on the same page. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. Um, help us amplify our voice that we want better than 85,000 H-1B caps available per year. We want better than this as the best option for your population. There hasn't been comprehensive immigration reform in nearly 30 years. So, you know, get in contact with your congressperson's immigration contact, you know, let them know that this is important to your company, to, um, you know, the growth of your business, the ability to hire U.S. workers. Uh, that's important. Participate in, uh, you know, when the uh, Department of Homeland Security requests information on proposed changes, participate in those. So presently, there's an open request for information on changing what's called Schedule A to include more STEM occupations, which would uh, enable a lot of employers to skip the Department of Labor PERM process for green card sponsorship. So if you have a critical need to fill STEM positions and you're having difficulty doing that and trying to look to foreign talent to do that, which I know a lot of clients are, it would be really helpful if Schedule A would be amended to include STEM, uh, STEM occupations. So there's other things, you know, that we can, uh, that we're trying to do that we would love to have that voice amplified and participation in. So certainly talk to your uh, attorney, talk to your team about ways that you can do that. Appreciate it. Thank you both. Um, we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, um, so the question is, is that asylum program fee applicable for every I-129 filed? For example, if it is the second or third extension for an individual, is that $600 still paid along with the filing fee for the I-129? Yes. Yeah, I can jump in there and confirm that it is uh, applicable to, to subsequent filings. Um, and I think probably the root of this question is that certain fees attached to H-1Bs, for example, are not applicable when it's, you know, the second extension that a company has filed on behalf of an employee. But uh, the asylum program fee, and this is sort of a point of contention, uh, that $600 fee for larger employers would attach to each I-129 filing, as well as I-140 filings for the green card process. So, um, you know, it, it is a significant addition in that sense. And any, uh, anything else to add from your side? I would say um, <laughs> one thing that employers have been experiencing as we've gone remote for the last few years is uh, on H-1B employees moving and that necessitating an amendment. So uh, from the USCIS fee perspective for amendments, oftentimes uh, the USCIS fee is, was only $460, the lower uh, of their fees. But since we have to file this $600 fee every time now, that's going to apply. So it gets more expensive if you've got, you know, employees moving around frequently because we do have to amend those most often um, for H-1B. Um, so final question, and then we'll look to, to kind of uh, close wrap things up for, for the day. Uh, if I don't have a law firm I'm working with at the moment, can I still submit an H-1B registration? I was just on USCIS's website and I saw that their like lead link is for registration. And as we all said, their information sharing really has been pretty good. So 
if someone digs into the CIS resources, USCIS.gov, you know, I'm fairly confident that they could register uh, on their own. Um, you know, that doesn't get into the background nuances of qualification and, you know, is there a better option or what are the background options, sort of that complete holistic uh, view of the individual. But that said, if you're looking to just get a really last minute individual registered, you can do it on your own. My own follow up to that question then is, can they work with uh, corporate immigration partners after a beneficiary is potentially selected? Absolutely. Yep. Great. Perfect. Uh, well, Scott and Anne, uh, any, any final words before we uh, log off for the day? Good luck to everyone. Yeah, we always yep. wish everybody good luck in the cap. Right. Yeah, we'll keep our fingers crossed. Awesome. Thank you both. Um, thank you both for hopping on to our first uh, LinkedIn Live session of 2024. To our attendees, thank you so much for joining us uh, on this uh, late morning or early afternoon, uh, wherever you may be located. Um, this was recorded. It'll be uploaded to our YouTube channel, so feel free to check it out later or if you were not able to attend. And as always, if you have any feedback for us, please uh, let us know. Thank you. Thanks, all. Thanks, everyone.